let's start with having you guys introduce yourselves. Um, and we want to welcome everybody to looking at uh, kind of social entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship with our alums who have started businesses. Um, and we're glad to have everybody here today. So this is pretty, it's pretty informal in terms of the interaction. So we're going to ask everyone to start with giving kind of their bios and how they got to where they are. So um, Matt, do you want to start? Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Edmondson. I am a, uh, a a IGL alum from oh I did Epic in 04 and I graduated in 05 and uh this is all making me feel very old um <laughs> since uh after Epic I um actually uh through Epic and through the IGL I was connected to a social entrepreneur named, named Sasha Chanoff and joined his um, refugee organization um out of school uh, it, at the time, it was called Mapendo International. Now it's called Refuge Point. It's based in um, Cambridge. And I worked there for four years. Um, and that organization does some really interesting work um, identifying and providing solutions for um, at-risk and vulnerable refugees, beginning, starting in, in, started in Nairobi, Kenya, and then expanded across to East, Central, and the Horn of Africa. And I think now they're all over Africa and, and large parts of the Middle East. Um, after that, I spent two years at NYU's business school. And out of that, I started um, a company with a friend that came out of classwork we did at, and, uh, at school, um, focused on iron deficiency anemia. And so um, I'm now, and that company started eight years ago. Um, it's called Violet Health. And we um, are interested in finding innovative ways and innovative solutions to increase, uh, decrease iron deficiency anemia amongst pregnant women. And so we're starting in India. And so I can talk about our, our products, but that's the, the high level. <laughs> Great. Anastasia? Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Anastasia. I am also uh, an EPIC alumna. I did EPIC in 2006, I believe. I am a double jumbo. I, I have um, a, um, the BA in political science and also a master's from the Fletcher School. So my interests while at TAPS were very political oriented and uh, um, however, going into the real world, things changed because I tried various jobs um, and, uh, in Greece because I am from Greece uh, and I went back. Uh, but none of them really worked out. Um, but uh, again, uh, for me, it was very important that um, in the job that I would end up uh, and to uh, would be related to my interests. And uh, uh, this eventually led me to uh, founding uh, Klosti, which is a social enterprise. It's an e-shop, um, uh, which sells uh, Greek handicrafts and uh, supports Greek craftsmen and their communities. Um, so this is where I am now. I oh, and Karen, sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I, I could have just started speaking. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Karen Singh. Um, I was also an EPIC alum. Uh, I was 0910 um, the South Asia year, and then I graduated 2011. Um, I studied computer science and economics, um, so I was a little bit uh, off the political science mold. Um, but I also, I was just kind of thinking about it when I was, when I was listening to both of you, like what it was, I was, where I was thinking when I came out of school and I feel like I was very confused when I came out of school, <laughs> like, cause I felt like I wanted to do something to like help the world, but then I was like, I also need a job and I was also dating someone. So I was like trying to figure out like where I was going to muddle through <laughs> all of this. Um, and I ended up, uh, like just doing the easiest path which was moving home and then I ended up like working for a startup in Seattle for a couple of years so that that was the path I ended up did going down it was very very serendipitous as, as Sherman would always say right that just kind of one thing led to another um but I went down a computer science or I went down a, a technology path so I worked as a product manager um for a number of years uh really kind of helping people take their ideas and make it into something that can be built as technology um, and then I uh, 
worked as a consultant doing that same kind of work, but for services um, for in a couple of different places. I worked in New York and I, then I worked in London. Uh, and then I had some work that took me to India um, and I moved to India in 2015 uh, and started working specifically in ed tech. Um, and at that point, um, through kind of a, a crazy series of events, uh, I ended up running this company that I was working at um, and uh, through a kind of interesting series of choices, uh, ended up selling one part of it and spinning out another part of it, but shutting a good portion of it down. So about 80% of the employees ended up uh, being laid off um, and going uh, to other roles. Um, and, uh, and then I, um, in that kind of process, I just met a lot of people in the startup community in India. And so I decided to, to just go and see what I could do to start and steer money um, and capital towards those people. So now I've been uh, pursuing, in addition to kind of pursuing my new, my new startup idea, I've also been pursuing uh, trying to steer capital towards just the non-traditional entrepreneurs um, in India. So like, just like in the US, there's a mold where it's like, you're white, you, you know, you're went to an Ivy League school uh, in India, it's kind of your, your, your male, your North Indian, uh, you went to an IIT, like those are kind of the people who get money. And so we're just kind of excited about seeing if we can push money towards people who, who don't fit that mold. Um, sorry, that was a longer introduction. <laughs> I kind of grabbed it and ran with it. <laughs> no, 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 uh, that's great, that's great. And now I'm gonna ask everyone to kind of um, describe the business, businesses they're currently working on. And so Matt, if you wanna start and kind of talk about, you know, so you're implementing it in India, like what that's what that whole process has been like from kind of finding funding to getting it going. Yep, 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 sure. Um, yeah, so the company's called Violet Health. Um, the, the idea that we first started with was, um, and I didn't know anything about nutrition before um, I stumbled into this, um, the idea of this work, um, I guess nine years ago now. And that was um, iron deficiency anemia is a major problem uh, it, it most affects pregnant women and the children that they have. Um, about 45% of pregnant, 45% uh, of pregnant women across the world don't have enough iron. Uh, and this leads to more death during, during childbirth, the process of childbirth itself, and all sorts of challenges for the mom and for the baby. The baby gets less iron uh, from the mother if the mother doesn't have a lot of iron. The baby then as, as he or she is growing, has challenges with, can have challenges because of that lack of iron with uh, brain development delays and physical skill, motor skill development delays. And what we thought was really um, challenging was that even though this is a kind of a, there's a standard solution, which is to recommend that pregnant women take iron tablets when they're pregnant um, and lactating, um, even when pregnant women have tablets have access to tablets. So when you take away access as a challenge, you run very quickly into a, 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 the challenge of adherence or compliance, which is um, unfortunately not true, not, not just true of in this case, but all over the world when doctors or medical professionals rec recommend that people take their medicine, um, especially if you take it over a long amount of time, vast, huge percentages of people don't take their medicine because they forget, because of uh, maybe for cultural reasons, um, they're dissuaded from by other important influencers in their lives not to take something, not to take, say, a tablet. Um, and so we got really interested in in India. You, we, we see um, a problem where pregnant women were being blamed by everyone else in the system for not taking their iron tablets, and no one was ever thinking um, or had thought about how can we one make this easier and two, you know they're blaming the pregnant women, not the product itself or any of the other pieces in the system, which has led to this situation, which is lots of um, pregnant women who have access to tablets don't take them, they don't get any better, and the problem persists. And so we got really interested in saying, can we move iron out of a tablet form to other uh, more um, palatable food forms that could all else equal increase compliance or adherence? And so we ended up, um, working with a research institute here that became uh, absolutely critical to our development to um, test and then uh, clinically do, do clinical studies that proved that the solutions that we were making were actually working. And so now we have a product on the market and we're looking at more products. Um, we have, a, it's an iron fortified biscuit for pregnant women. And we've clinically shown that if you take this biscuit every day, it's a, a small biscuit, um, if you take three of them, every day it's the same as taking a tablet so we've done uh, now we've worked with government to try to um, increase uh, the likelihood of getting into government procurement um, supply chain 
uh, we've now have the product uh, on sale in the market where we have a sales force that goes and visit doctors and, and um, nutritionists and nurses and maternity hospitals and other and other uh, places to talk about the product, talk about our work, and to try to get the word out that there is an alternative to a tablet now. Um, and so my initial kind of um, thing that I just talked about here is, is crucial that um, that partnership with that research institute has been for everything that we've done by by having a base of science and a base of of, of a credible local partner that has ex existed for a long time in in where I am right now Bangalore um, that is also known across the country so that's the quick very quick uh, summary of that great great Anastasia So, <clears throat> uh, how I started um, CLOSTI, uh, as I said uh, in my introduction earlier, I wanted um, to have a job to do something that uh, had uh, an impact on the society, on the people where I, I was residing, where I was living. So, uh, one of the uh, issues like we have in Greece is that our demographics and our urban structures is such that almost all uh, over 50% of the population resides in the Athens metropolitan area, leaving um, the rural areas and the smaller towns with like very uh, small economies and mainly relying on tourism. Uh, when I realized that there were um, ha uh, craftsmen, artists, and people that were working in mini studios uh, uh, in various places all over Greece, I thought that it would be a good idea to provide them with a platform that uh, they could um, have uh, sales uh, and therefore increase their income as opposed to just uh, working locally and selling in their city or relying only on the tourists that would visit their city in, during the summer months. Uh, so Clostee has, uh, has as a mission to uh, showcase the best Greek handicrafts, uh, uh, which oftentimes also have a very strong uh, Greek cultural background that relates to our heritage and things like that. Uh, but most importantly, to uh, be able to provide additional income to those craftsmen and therefore support their communities and the local economy. Uh, eventually, uh, in the longer run, once uh, Klosti is more has deeper roots and is more, um, you know, the, the, the economy uh, permits and now COVID permits and uh, we have less barriers and um, I intend also to do more, um, uh, to do um, events, like uh, live events basically, as where I'll, uh, I'll be visiting um, the communities and in partnership with an artist or a craftsman, we would do a seminar to women to show them that there are ways of like uh, starting their own business. Uh, legal stuff that they don't know and uh, things that, um, you know, that are beyond their their scope of knowledge basically so uh this is uh clearly what it is it's an e-shop basically that it's a for-profit um social enterprise that uh tries to bring out the best of uh, greek handicrafts great thank you and karen um yeah um I guess I'll uh, answer in a slightly different vein, just because I'm a little bit at a different place in my, my startup journey than um, uh, they both are. Um, I think I'll first just kind of like talk about like that process and how it looked like from the India perspective and then come and kind of talk about how it looked like from, from where I am now and kind of trying to start a company that's going to be uh, more remote because it's COVID times forever. <laughs> um, so I'd say from the India perspective and definitely something that I didn't uh, just value enough when I was coming out of school um, is how much regulation really just uh, is a challenge and how much like kind of just understanding, especially in India, like what, what you're dealing with um, can just help set you up for success later. Um, I 
can't think of a great example uh, in India, but I can think of an example. I set up an LLC last year and like we followed all these forms we followed online and it was great. Uh, and then we needed to like, like someone else was going to put some more money in a little later. So we need to have an amendment to change the ownership of the LLC. And so we went to this lawyer to be like, listen, we need to drop this amendment. She was like, well, you just fucked everything up in the beginning. So if you would just come to me in the beginning, it would have been like a flat rate of like $200. And then, you know, doing an amendment like this, I would have given you a template and you would have been able to do that yourself. Right. And so I feel like there's certain things that I've now realized is basically if you can find someone who has done what you're trying to do before and talk to them about what they did and what sort of like services they used, who did they go, who did they do themselves and what things did they go to other service providers for? It is so helpful. Um, even if it is like in a related or corollary industry or even a little further away, but it's someone you trust and you feel like they are sensible and they operate in a similar way to you do with similar values. Another key point that is come more and more in my life right understanding what sort of values people are operating with um that really is just it makes it so much helpful because you understand what path you might want to follow um as i'm kind of thinking about now and i know heather you kind of did ask about the funding part of that question um i've never been one to go down like a, a grant sort of path just with my work uh, i've always been more of like an angel investor and like like you know then trying to to get money from bc sort of path um, I will say that that path sends your, your thinking in a certain way. Um, Karin, which I, I don't know. Karin, yeah. Just before you continue, can you just, you just explain an angel investor? Oh, sir. Sorry. Um, so, so, uh, angel investors, uh, just when you're, when you're starting a company, um, you will usually, if you can, self-fund maybe your first few months, right? Um, and so you're just putting your own money in. But after that, you might go out and try and raise money from other people. Um, and usually those will be friends and family. Uh, but if you don't have friends and family that you can go and get money from in order to start a company, then you'll be looking for other people who are willing to invest at that really early stage. Um, and then the term they have is angel investors, right? Because it's like an angel has come and given you money when you don't have any, <laughs> or at least this is how I always remember it. Um, but, but right, so they're really early stage. They're usually not coming in with huge checks. Even in these kind of crazier times, you're talking like, you know, $5,000 to maybe like, I don't know, maximum like 50. I would be shocked if you're going to get more than like $50,000 from an angel investor. Um, but those are going to be people who are really going to help you um, early on. They usually trust you. You, they, you built a relationship outside of the company. Um, they, they have some reason to believe you're going to be successful outside of just like the, the data that is generated by your company or your idea so far, because that's probably not very much because it's an idea, you know. Um, now I totally lost my train of thought, Heather. What was I saying before? Shoot. <laughs> oh, You're going I did. To classes. Uh huh. Angel investor, and then the next step. Uh yeah. Um. <laughs> no, I totally lost my train. Of thought. <laughs> um. Uh, it's okay. We can. Uh, I'll figure it out. We're talking about starting. What you were starting. The differences between India and here. Okay. Um. Yeah, so I would say, um, I think maybe I was talking about like the difference in raising money in India versus here. Oh yeah, yeah, grants versus funding. Yeah, yeah, there we are, thank you. Um, so uh, India, interestingly, has a lot more, I would say like funny money I've discovered, which is just people have money that they're, they're willing to invest for like random reasons. It's just like people have India money that's locked up. Oftentimes it's maybe not fully legal, right? Again, there's just lots of, lots of morality issues that you start to jump into. But um, in the US, I would say, yeah, there's like a couple of different paths. You can apply to some incubators. Um, you can try and raise money from angels, like I was talking about. Um, or you can kind of go down a, a grant sort of path um, to try and get yourself off the ground. But I will, I will happily turn that over to Matt to talk more about the grant side of the path, because I've never done it. <laughs> uh, yeah, Heather, do you want me to start talking about that? Or I don't want to throw off your question. No, no, no. I think, I think talking about funding, and I'd also be sure. I think everybody be interested in hearing about like where do you hit different kind of bumps in the road you know and what are the <laughs> well what are the surprises yeah. you know Karin was talking yeah. about finding someone yeah. who can kind of lead you down the path and I know you know and I'm yeah. also thinking working in a different country you know what do you you know what did you wish you had known before or a little earlier than you found out <laughs> yeah yeah I mean um 
so if everyone has 22 hours here, we'll, we'll begin. Um, the, uh, yeah, okay, so the, the, the short answer is, um, um, Karen, absolutely, like I couldn't agree more. There are so many things that you, uh, you, wish, you wish you knew, but you also like people that you trust that you wish you knew. And like building that, um, building that cohort around you is, is very um, time consuming and potentially resource consuming if they screw you or if you, you know, you know, you don't realize that they're really important until after you've made the documents and then it suddenly it's like very complicated to go back and re, re do that stuff. And, you know, there's like a hundred examples where, yeah, I've done the exact same thing where we think we're, you think that you can kind of do it on the cheap or say, Oh no, this, this should be fine. We'll do it this way. And you don't kind of, you know, uh, exhaustively go through all the legal options first and, and you, um, you end up regretting it later. So I guess to back up for a second, from a um, funding perspective, um, I think especially as, so I was in, um, for, for those students who are graduating now or about to graduate, um, I was in the same position uh, after leaving grad school with having an idea for a company, but having no money to do anything with and then trying to figure out, well, like I didn't have any savings to pay my, you know, to do anything. So. Um, we were lucky, and Tufts has a lot of resources, and, and I, I think one of the cool things about the IGL and Tufts, um, but especially the IGL, is how much, you know, there are always, they will help you find little pockets of money all over the place to try to scrounge together to fund, you know, your, your machinations, and so, and I, and I, one is, even though people say those have dried up, they haven't, they're just harder to find now, probably. Like, I'm sure there are still pockets of this money around, and you just have to be really polite and insistent and you will find them eventually. Um, there are cool things like, uh, I know Tufts has a um, great business uh, business plan competition that has different categories. I'm almost positive one of them is social enterprise. It used to be, so I, I don't imagine they would have removed that. Um, and so that has funding. We were very fortunate just when I graduated um, that my, the co-founder and I received uh, a pot of funds from NYU to do the same thing. But then we went the grant route and um, depending on your business model and kind of what it's going to take to get um, to get profits and what um, what what inf what infrastructure you are as a company and where what country you're based in and how the if you have multiple companies in multiple countries how that how those things are connected um, grants can be a great way to basically give you some support while you try to figure out all these other things. And so we were very fortunate to get a couple of funds. One was USAID's Development Innovation Ventures, DIV for short. Um, it was shut down at the early in the early days of uh, Rex Tillerson, if anyone remembers that gentleman. Um, and now, now it's back. Actually, surprisingly, it's back. So USAID DIV is back. You can get grants. Um, the, I think the initial funding stage is hundred thousand dollars. So you can get and and for profit companies can get that if they can prove that their innovation that's being funded by this will have a broader societal benefit. So I would check out that if you have interesting ideas. I would also check out um, Grand Challenges um, is the umbrella name for a bunch of different funds of which the Gates Foundation is one, um, a fund called the Grand Challenges Canada is another. A number of, of funders, if you Google Grand Challenges, have, have different pots of money for, um, for uh, either different very specific ideas they have in terms of saying, oh, you know, how do you make the cold chain more efficient in parts of, parts of rural Eastern Africa or whatever. Um, and so there's very specific challenges, but if you happen to fit one of those, you can get 100 grand or 250 grand um, that can help you know, push, push you along. So we survived on that early on. And then um, from USAID, uh, USAID DIV, from Grand Challenges Canada, and then recently we've had investors and um, and also uh, a, a grant from the Gates Foundation. So it depends on, you know, I, th I think one of the a major thing is if you're interested in doing this, I would talk to friends to talk to a, a competent lawyer in whatever jurisdiction you think you want to do this and run this by them and make sure that you are from the beginning kind of do all this in a kosher way so you can 
don't have any massive challenges that are potentially existential later when you decide, oh, we want to now do this extra thing. And probably there's one in the IGL community, as I discovered later, right? But just ah, ask yeah, your IGL yeah, friends, because right. <laughs> someone will know someone. <laughs> totally, totally. Um, and uh, what's the name of it? Um, there's a name of a, if you get in, uh, I'll look in my email, um, and I'll have it by the end of this talk here, about, it's a, it's a community that helps for nonprofits and for-profit for social enterprises with their, um, their, their legal is for free. What's it called? I'll, I'll, I'll come up with it. Just as another small aside, kind of off what Matt was saying, I do have a good friend who started something called Three Wheels United, and they did a really interesting model. So they ended up splitting into a foundation and a um, for-profit company. What they do is electric auto rickshaws. Um, so and what they discovered, they were operating in India, uh, what they discovered was that the problem was not even driving adoption of the electric auto rickshaws, it was financing because um, auto drivers, uh, you know, these are like the three wheelers, right? So they, they don't actually pay for their vehicles outright, they cost about $2,000. Uh, they, they get financed by these like people who, you know, obviously, because it's India, uh, charge absorbent interest rates and uh, get them into a cycle of debt. Um, so, so three years United ended up becoming um, the the for-profit company became a financing company. The technology of the auto rickshaw was owned by the foundation, and then the foundation would go and get all of the grants to take this to like other countries. So it was just interesting because like you can build these structures where um, you can be eligible as a nonprofit and then also have like an associate for-profit that you're licensing your tech to. Basically, it depends cool. on what your idea is, like Matt was saying. Yeah, that's cool. It's a great name too. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah, really cool. good. Really good. Wow. Wow. Cool. Uh, where are they based? Uh, they are in some tier two city that I cannot remember right now. It's either like Pune or like, it's somewhere like that that they've actually done in a rollout. They're trying to do one in Delhi and in Chennai. Um, but the interesting place that they realized is to go and partner with the city governments on last mile. So, right, like we'll have our three wheelers like waiting outside of the metro station or the bus drop off and we'll help those people get home um, and, you know, reduce congestion and smog and all that in the process. So, but as always with India, it's a long journey of regulation and like <laughs> ass kissing. Can I say that? Ass kissing <laughs> in the right places. <laughs> Great. And honestly, we were talking about, um, how you kind of like the the challenges you found in starting the business you know how you financed it what were some of the bumps in the road do you want to talk about that for Quilty? sure uh uh yeah i i think uh, if i have like one sentence summary is that there are a lot of bumps i don't know because i was disconnected for a few minutes if i've like uh, if I, Matt or Kahran have uh, mentioned that before, but I think uh, that if there is one thing I can say is that there are, um, there are a lot of bumps and that you need a lot of patience and resilience and, you know, every ounce of like, uh, you know, like hope you have, you have, because there are days that are so bad that, that you feel like not only that you're not making money or you're wasting, your, you know, that there is no hope and this thing cannot change for the better. But uh, um, if you have a good uh, vision and a better even mission, uh, I think these two um, will propel you to the right direction. Um, also, I mean, you have to do work. It's not that, you know, just the vision and the mission, but I think they serve as the right compass for you to make those decisions that will eventually uh, the, um, the enterprise forward, the, the business, whatever. Um, and for me, that has been very, very, you know, the fact that I knew exactly what, what, what I was doing, why I was doing it. And the fact that uh, also it made, it made sense within my personal life, because I want to mention that, uh, that uh, one of the reasons why I started um, this business um, is the fact that I, I'm a mother of uh, very small children. And the fact that I wanted something flexible. Uh, so it resonated with me that I would have to do tons of work, but at least I could do them in my own time, more or less, or I could not, I would not have to sleep in the night maybe. But um, 
uh, you know, it made sense to me that that was because I, I was more present in the early years of my children than I could have ever been if I was working outside of my home. Um, having said that, uh, I, I, I want to stress that starting up a business, let alone if you have small children, is a very difficult thing. It's not the easy route. It's not the, the, the stress less route. It's even more like, you know, it's like you have a, a plate from a buffet and suddenly you have like a second and a third plate. This is how it is. It's very complicated. But again, if you have like this clear vision and mission, you make, um, you, you make, um, good decisions, you, you talk to the right people, uh, I think you can move forward. Um, in terms of funding, uh, for specifically for me, to, I haven't I haven't had uh, such huge impact and positive impact for um, from outsider investors um, um, yet. I'm I will be looking that when I want to scale up eventually when my 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 kids enter in a more of a schooling environment. Um, uh, um, so I, in more or less, I've been up, I've been operating with my, ca my capital, which I have invested back in the business. Um, uh, uh, I think one general uh, piece of advice that I would give that I think applies to your, to most, uh, social businesses, regardless of the actual, like, um, subject that they are doing is that you have to have like excellent organization skills because um if you are on your own or even if you are with another person and you're doing this together there's so many things that you have to be look at look um and um organize and be current which could be legal things which could be financial things um it's not like any employment that you take up and you have what you need to do and perhaps a bit more here it's the world and you against you are against the world basically trying to make it so i think that's also very important from my experience and also a third thing perhaps would be the fact that um you really go into untested waters and uh, by that i mean that you do make mistakes but again you have the possibility to refine and retune what you're doing uh so next time you can anticipate or you can co course correct so uh you try things and um you may succeed or fail for example in my case i uh, i i i started with a certain amount of products then i realized which ones were more popular i focused more on those i i tried to sort of like discontinue others or um, in terms of like marketing the way i approach different um market uh uh you know where i see for example um the fact that i sell greek handicrafts i thought that it would appeal to greek expatriates living in germany in, in germany there are almost a quarter of a me um, three quarters of a million of greek expatriates however for one reason or another they seem not to be that much interested and I'm, i haven't been able to capture that on the other side, I have been able to find like um, non-Greek people that really love and support and want to help Greece for whatever other reason. So, uh, the in a way, um, in my case at least, um, uh, the, the the way you have to go also becomes revealed to you as you move on, and you make mistakes and you course correct, and this is how I'm, I've been able to move forward. Great, great. And I was wondering um, if you guys want to go um, a little more specifically, like maybe Matt, you want to talk about because you've hired a local, local staff to work and some of the, the pros and cons of that and what that's been like, especially since I mean, now you've been in India because of COVID, but before when you were traveling back and forth. Yeah, um, very good question. Uh, how would I put this? Uh, yeah, so I guess we're, so we're in a very particular industry, which is medicine. Um, we are we are selling to um, pregnant women and their doctors, principally the vast, vast majority of um, OBGYNs in India are women. And um, and what's uh, what is um, confusing at first is if you look at the sales force, that sells you know, these sales reps, that medical reps, um, that visit these principally 
women doctors with women patients is it's all men. And for a variety of reasons, um, the, the industry is 99.999% men. And so we were very interested at the beginning of this process in having as much as we could an exclusive female sales force. Um, which has proven difficult for a variety of reasons, but um, but we have some wonderful employees, and it's um, it's uh, it's always. I mean, I think managing people is always very difficult, and it's the hardest thing that at least I do. And um, I mean, I hear this from other friends as well that just figuring out how to manage people. Um, regardless of where they're from or where you're from or whatever is really hard and every aspect of it is hard from figuring out how do you do salaries to how do you do you know how do you how do you maintain a, a culture of excellence um, and how do you build it and, and what does it look like and and, and th there's a lot of things where it's just really um, I think Anastasia what you just said about about like you have to start you have to like you 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 get things wrong and you like pick yourself up and you try to do it again and you just keep going um, that's what we've, we've tried to do. And, um, but it's, it's very difficult in, in this industry in particular, at least here in Bangalore. And from what I hear from friends in, in other parts of India, um, the churn rate is very high. And so, um, people will, you know, uh, people will leave for, you know, they, if they can get a bonus, um, of several percent more, um, for themselves and their families. And that's what they want to do. They will. And so as a result, the, the industry has grown up to where you have um, kind of the expectation is that people will leave quickly, that people will not be loyal to the product or the, to the company because the company is not loyal to them. And so it's hard to, so kind of when you're starting off, you can kind of make this decision, are we going to hire people within this industry and kind of, in effect, you'll have to take on at least some of these cultural, these kind of um, these in in industry mores as you bring them in, or do you want to kind of reject that and say, we're going to hire our own people and build this ourselves um, in, in an atmosphere where, um, you know, you know, with a new product. I mean, so it's, I would say all of this stuff is really hard. I would say the, um, the thing to do is to get a lot of people to, to ask these questions about and to try to be, you know, to, to be very open about what are your challenges and talk to people about what they are and try to figure out how you can kind of work on this together. Because there's not going to be one kind of one, one size fits all um, answer. But, um, but if you get it wrong, you know, it's, it can be very, very, very um, destructive. It can be very um, difficult. You know, that can be the thing that can end your idea and your company and your whole vision and all the things that, you know, you wanted to do good um, and, and then, you know, you kind of, you fall flat on the management front. So it's really hard and I wish I had an easy answer or I wish it was easy. <laughs> um, this is the thing that I wish you could, I wish colleges and business schools and everyone taught this, like, and I know it's a very difficult thing to teach as well, but it's really difficult. And I wish that, um, we talked about it more often as a, as a society, what we could do and how we can make it better. Um, because it seems like what we're doing right now, at least from my point of view, is, is it's not, it's not, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Karin, do you want to talk about that too, in terms of hiring or working with people? Um, sure. I also want to tell a different story. Okay. Um, but I'll answer your question first. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I realized that the story I want to tell, and I'll tell in a minute, um, is okay. I was just thinking it's really interesting how like I arrived, because we were effectively running a social enterprise, right? We were running this ed tech company that was trying to build a marketplace for tutors. And what we were trying to do is help people who taught out of their home, um, like improve themselves enough that they would be able to teach more kids, uh, either like at a time, like kids would travel to their homes or they'd be more efficient. Um, and then uh, they would be better and, you know, they would want to use this technology and, uh, you know, the thing would all spread. And we peaked at like 8,000 tutors on our platform. But mm -hmm. the thing we eventually realized was that the idea didn't work and it wasn't sustainable. <laughs> um, so, uh, but I'll come back to that. To, to answer your question specifically, I think um, the thing that was really interesting for me to learn 
and I, I don't mean to oversimplify that, but I feel like it really fell into the kind of two schools for me that there's like a carrot style of management and there's a stick style of management. Um, and I grew up in a world of the carrot, very much the carrot, right? Like, like our, I remember in like school, people would like, it was more like psychological, right? Like you knew the best kids got treated in a certain way. And like, if you did thing, everything right, you got special privileges, but no one's gonna beat you, right? <laughs> like <laughs> that is not the schools we grew up in. <laughs> um, whereas in India, you know, Know, like like literally people got grow, grow up and like you would be humiliated you know and that was regularly a style of, of teaching um, and so I think for me to as a manager particularly to kind of learn about how to just be you know some people you're literally going to be managing because they're afraid of you and like you just have to figure out how do you manage that balance of like you know yes like you don't want to disappoint me is going to work for some people, but some people they're like, well, you know, I'm afraid you're going to fire me or I'm afraid I'm going to get like yelled at, you know, or scolded or something. I didn't really, I'm not very good at yelling at people. I'm too smiley. So they just don't take me seriously. <laughs> um, and then they're like, one day I'm firing someone. They're like, what the fuck? You like smiled at me every day. And I'm like, dude, I just smile at people. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, but um, that was kind of a, been an interesting process. I actually found what was most effective for me um, and you could call this a cop out if you want, <laughs> but I moved a lot of the the like like sales um, and like like customer sur support, like our field customer support, um, just like like a lot of these like much lower skilled, uh, lower paid roles where you know we would be paying people uh, maybe two to to three lakhs per annum, so like like six to what like ten thousand dollars a year. Um, I just like put someone else in between me <laughs> and like because I like I just was not as good at kind of inspiring that like fear uh as like people I could hire to do um and you know at one point my literally my aunt who's like a retired like hotel executive uh she I was like my acting like like finance officer so everyone had to like go to her <laughs> to get sign off on any of their purchases um they're so affected because they're all terrified of her right <laughs> they're like because she's just like she brings mm -hmm. a, a presence um, but if I can really quickly just finish the story I wanted to tell. Okay, thanks. Um, I was just going to say the thing that was really interesting, really hard to learn was how do you, how do you know when your idea doesn't work, you know? Um, and especially in my case where I wasn't having investors telling me that they were on, they weren't going to give me more money. Um, but what I realized was that me and my leadership team, as we kind of were sitting around, we realized we could keep putting money in, but people didn't like the product. The tutors didn't care really enough that we were giving them technology to help them teach better. As, a, as I kind of talk about it now, it didn't make their lives 10x better. It made it maybe 1x or two times better. They weren't so much more efficient and that wasn't enough to do a behavior change. Uh, maybe in some ways, I don't know if Matt kind of feels like these same probably it's not enough to make people do a behavior change if they don't feel like their life is being transformed in some way. And so it's just so hard to get people to change behavior. Um, so these tutors would just drop off, we'd lose kids, we had so poor retention that we was, it was clear we could keep pumping money into the business, getting more students, and we'd keep losing them by the end of the year. And some students were having an amazing outcome, but a lot of them, you know, maybe we were helping, maybe we weren't. It was really hard to tell. Um, and I think the thing that, and maybe I guess it kind of comes back to that moral thing I was saying earlier, that the thing that was for me is I had to stand up and say, hey, I want your money. And I want your money because I believe that I'm going to achieve these things with it. And what I found was it was really hard for me to justify that, even though I had all these people depending on me for their jobs. And I had like, you know, kids who are like, we have to finish the school year. Like there's all these outcomes we have to make sure we, we achieved. It was that I had to stand up and say, I want your money because I'm going to achieve this, you know? And when I stopped being able to feel like we could achieve it, when we didn't see a path where we were saying that, yes, someday we are going to be able to expand outside of Bangalore and expand throughout India. And like, it didn't seem possible. It didn't seem like this, we kept putting money into this marketplace and it kept hemorrhaging out the other side. Um, so I don't know. So I think it's just an interesting point to kind of, you have to stand, like figure out where those checkpoints are to say, have I put in enough? Like, and is there, cause there is a point where you have to say, maybe your idea just doesn't work, even if like, and you have to just do something else with your life and make everyone else do something else with their lives, uh, as hard as that is. Um, so, yeah. Great. And um, one of the questions is for, for Klosti, um, how do you manage the relationships with the, the artists or the artisans or the craftspeople? And how challenging is that? And especially when you were talking about how to potentially discontinue something that you were doing, you know, like a line that wasn't really popular? 
Um, yeah, that, this is a very good question, I have to admit. Um, it's uh, very complicated and very difficult, uh, primarily now because I have over 20 different workshops I collaborate with, which means 20 different people. So, um, and it's also very stressful because uh, w something that is handmade has, um, it needs time. It's not like, you know, that you can like go into production and get something very quickly. So timing um, with regard to orders is also a big challenge. But when it comes to, to the people factor, um, I don't have very good news to share. I mean, my, I, the way I go about is that in my mind, I have like um, a profile for every person. So I know who is quick, fast, reliable, and I know who is on the other side of the spectrum, basically. So I try to sort of like talk the language, you know, that is like appropriate um, to each person. For example, the, to those that, um, First of all, I must admit that uh, I don't collaborate with someone uh, unless I know that they are really good um, in what they do and they give me quality work. This for me is like, uh, you know, the red line. I can tolerate, you know, like time delays and things like that. These are the things that I mentioned before that I'm trying to, you know, to manage each person differently. But the standard is that they all have to have good quality. So again, um, I have an approach, the way I talk to them is differently. So basically I do all this like work um, in order to get what I want. Um, and it's very hard. Um, uh, I try to promote the people that are, um, that bring sales, but also the people that do genuine effort and uh, are willing to cooperate with me to produce um, unique creations like uh, custom creations. And I try to bring them more work because sometimes I can do that. I can, um, you know, um, decide who, what I want, where, what the direction I want to go. Um, usually, um, the um, the the lines that fade out and are disconnected. It's sort of like um, a, a story that um, uh, you know that uh, you you can see it happening before it happens. Uh, it could be, for example, that the product is very specific. It could be that um, they, they do not support it well with like new creations because. For example, you may have like a pen and uh, the first time you put the pen, no matter how cool it is, unless people, you know, see it for a few times, they are really, they, they usually don't buy it from the first time. However, if on like a uh, year number two, you bring, or season number two, you bring like another pen. So the one pen basically helps the other. So what I'm trying to say is that if they are not supporting with like new lines where they show their evolution or when the, uh, if they're not, for example, um, uh, cooperative enough to you know give me for example photographs that i can use in marketing or like a uh, text and their story and their craft because i don't know like everybody's story or craft uh so these are basically the corporations that tend to fade in time but it's very hard and it's a um it's a, a, a cooperation that is of mutual interest it's so it's not like one uh, within a hierarchy uh, and some people take it seriously and they want to nurture it. Some other people, not so much. Uh, but, uh, you know, I find ways to, you know, to work with people. Mm -hmm. Great, great. And one of the questions is, um, so Matt, you went to business school, and Anastasia, you went to Fletcher. Karen, you chose not to go to grad school. What role do the grad schools play or not play kind of in how you moved in the direction you're moving or decided to develop, you know, go in an entrepreneurial direction. Whoever wants to start. Um, I can start. Okay. Uh, I, um, uh, I would say that like, you have to, I mean, I, I don't mean to be pedantic, but like, you know, if you do a cost benefit analysis, that's like what you have to do, right? So like, how, what are you doing right now? What do you expect to be doing at the end of it? Um, and is it going to be uh, worth it to kind of make that change? The things that I have always felt is like, if I was trying to make a career switch or if I felt like I was being held back in some way, um, until now, neither of those things have been true. Of late, or I mean, earlier this is like in the last, you know, 
12 months since I shut down the company, which was a little bit of a traumatic event. Because <laughs> um, it's just like a lot, you know. Um, I did really strongly consider going to grad school because I mostly just wanted to change the speed. Um, but then I realized, like, I think I was just having like a, you know, like I want to do something else. But I think that's also fair, right? Like if you're in a place where you can do that, then, then sure. The thing you just have to remember is like, not only are you paying a lot of money, it's also lost earning potential, right? So like just keeping that in mind that like you could have made money for those two years, um, which is a lot. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I would just like say that because uh, I've already, because I got to work in a couple of different countries uh, when I was consulting and because like now I spent enough time working in India and in the US that I have a good base of connections in both places. I don't really feel that lack because I feel like I know enough people that I could get to the people I need to know in my in my second degree connections. Um, so I don't feel the lack right now of, of uh, having not gone to grad school. Matt, do you wanna? Sure, yeah, I mean, no, I think, I think as time has gone on, I think you're totally right, God. I mean, I, I, I think the, the barriers to, uh, to a lot of businesses, if you have your experience and, you know, um, the, the width and breadth of your experience, you can kind of ignore, or, you know, now it, it doesn't matter. And, you know, there's nothing that's holding you back. Uh, yeah, business school degrees not holding you back. I would say, I would say, it's a very personal decision it yeah i think it's 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 very expensive it's very from both time and money um but it can be the thing that can really pivot you if you can and there's also some very very specific jobs that it's very difficult to get without certain stamps um so if you want to go into finance in very specific roles um actually well, these days now i mean maybe a math phd is better than an mba um but uh, for, you know, you have to go to certain schools uh, for consulting companies. It's, you know, there, there's ways to get in after, after um, undergrad, but then there's kind of a very well-worn path from certain schools to consulting companies if you're interested in having that experience. Um, so uh, yeah, I was, um, I was looking for a change and I was interested in knowing the language of business and, and, um, Previous to business school, I had worked for a startup, the Refuge Point that I discussed, but it was a nonprofit. And so I didn't have any of the technical business language. And I felt that I, I, I wanted, I was interested in learning that. So that's kind of, I thought I would go back to Kenya after business school, but um, fate intervened. But, but that's, that's my story anyway. I guess maybe I should mention my dad's an entrepreneur and my sister's an entrepreneur. So I maybe I'm not having the exact same circumstances as everyone else around like, yeah, because I do think I, I was actually wondering that like Matt, like what you kind of feel like you learned and took away. But it sounds like, well, I don't know. What, what do you feel like you learned? In, like, do you apply things you learned in business school? Yeah, I mean, I and I also very specifically targeted very quickly. I kind of realized that I wanted like I wanted to do my own thing, and so you could I could take classes that were very particular for this actually as well. So I had a very very kind of tailored experience from that point of view. So um, yeah, every day I feel like, and also like I had no accounting background. I had no I had a kind of I did econ degree at Tufts, so I had a, the standard econ. Uh, um, background it from uh, from tops but n nothing like from a business perspective so you probably had that just in when growing up Anastasia um, I don't feel any wiser to, I, I, I don't feel <laughs> like uh, I can it's very I think um, you have to factor in like which uh, pathway you want to follow because like Matt said very correctly uh, there are some places where you have to have a degree um, uh, and very specific degree there are other things that with a general degree you can go with your life on. Um, so it um, it really depends uh, you know if uh, if you and, and it also depends on how you feel about things if you feel you 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 have enough maybe you can just omit it uh, i i don't have like a, like a very good advice very specific advice what i can say though is that um, the more um, uh, training you get uh, in terms of academic training and the more um, 
uh, you develop your skills. Uh, uh, this you'll find it later on in your life. Uh, I think that um, what I did at Fletcher was very, very like uh, important for me to, to, to get where I am um, uh, because it really advanced my thoughts, my, the way I think, my analytical schemes, things like that. I, I, and, um, you know, uh, these are very important. I cannot, though, um, answer the question, you know, could you have done that without Fletcher? Could you have done, you know, or like put the, the point or the dot? I'm not there yet to answer that, that specifically. Uh, however, having said that, I think that once you decide on a trajectory you want to move and a pathway you want to decide with your business, you, you really have to, uh, to keep being informed and read and uh, think and talk with people um, about that because really it's an ongoing process and really you have to learn and question and you know if you ever uh, uh, sit down and accept and you think that you're doing things well uh, unless you're very fortunate and the numbers back that up you really are not doing I think the most you can and uh, there's so much more out there and the, you know you're just maybe like you have a thread like Klosti is a great word for thread and you you move your thread and you think you're doing something but you really could do so much more so it really helps to you know to do more things and uh, and uh, in that regard I, I you know I, I believe that education is probably the most important thing whether it's an advanced degree an associate degree whatever an online degree uh, uh, education is very important to, to keep moving forward mm -hmm. Great, great. And the last question we have is, um, Karen, you had brought this up and it's curious about whether everybody has dealt with this. The idea kind of of what you talked about values and morals, you know, which some are interpreting as, you know, kind of contending with potentially corruption or bribery. <laughs> like, how do you, how do you, have you faced that and how do you address that or manage that, especially if it's kind of um, a given in some places? I went first last time. Okay. Matt, Matt you want to go? <laughs> uh, sure. Yeah. So um, I would even broaden it more than that. It's like at every moment you can decide, like, you know, uh, I don't want to make this too theoretical though. Um, you know, when you're the decision maker or a co-decision maker, um, you know, at every stage you can decide, like, do I want to take a, try to do a shortcut here? And that can be like, okay, this legal form is probably good enough or this is probably good enough. You don't have to, you know. So uh, every single thing you do, um, so there are, there are a million things to do. Um, you don't have time to do all of them thoroughly. And that's the challenge. And so what you have to do is on a bunch of stuff, you have to strategically be like, this is good enough. If it fails, I can, I can change it like without much cost, right? Um, you're going to get a lot of those things wrong. And, and I have for sure a lot of them. So you think like, oh, I'll take this shortcut here. Um, and it won't come back to bite me and it'll probably be fine. But if it, if it, if they, if something comes happens, I'll then fix it when it happens. Cause I don't have time. You know, I could do this in 15 minutes or in three hours, but I have 50 other things to do that each could that same 15 minutes or three hours. So I guess, especially when you begin, there are so many of those and the, the it might not even be a three hour problem. It might be a five hour and $2,000 problem. Um, where you have to get real um, good advice from someone to to adequately look into it, make a decision um, in, a, in, a, in a way. So I guess every single one of those, it's really hard and you just don't know. And any one of those could in the end kill you. And that's, I guess, the other challenge is like, you know, so I guess one of the challenges of when you read about it, how an entrepreneur failed, it's like, I can tell you right now the, the 150 reasons why we're going to fail. And one of them is going to be right. Um, it's just really hard and you just don't have enough time to do every single piece the way a company with 2000 people can do it. And so if you extend that to kind of corruption bribery questions, it's the same sort of thing. It's like, do I want to do this right and say, I'm not going to move. I'm not going to pay a bribe to get into this, whatever, to, to get access to X. Um, you have to then, and then the, the challenge of that is it's hard to go back and later say, Oh no, I, we as a company or we as a, you know, I as a person, 
morally abhor those who pay bribes. Like you can't say that after the fact. You can only say that once and then you can't bend. So um, I think these are all things that like, I only know my experience, um, you know, I mean, this is something that everyone who works in any country in the world has to face um, because it's corruptions everywhere and there's, and it's, you know, quieter and more overt and more covert in different scenarios. And I, I won't, I won't say what's right for whoever is working. How we say is I say the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act will make me go to jail if I pay you a bribe and I don't want to go to jail. So we're not going to do it. And so far that's been okay for us. And we haven't, you know, um, uh, you know, I, one, we haven't done anything that I am, you know, at night awake and worried that someone's going to knock on the door and arrest me. Um, but two, I think also like, you know, those decisions also leach into everything you do as a company. So if, if someone saw or knew that I or someone else, you know, my, my co-founder took bribes, like, the, the 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 whole kind of the moral foundations of the company you have to think about as well and so that might work for you in whatever scenario and you may you may decide that it's worth the lives you save as a result if you're in a certain area and i'm i'm not judging at all for those that have to make that decision or that's the decision they make but for us that's kind of how we've made it so far and it's worked anyone yeah, else yeah. Um, so first of all, I think that this question um, came um, as like it brought a shockwave into me, not, um, not because I'm involved or anything, but because it really reminded me of like epic 2006 when we did like Hannah Arendt's like uh, the dirty hands, which of course is in a, within a political situation. But yet again, it uh, you know, the whole dilemma, the means and the end and everything, it's a very like um, a powerful thing. Um, uh, I have to say two things. I have two comments. First of all, um, uh, w well, what, what I do is not nearly as important or relevant as what Matt and Kahran are doing. Like, I'm really like very small, like, a, a, you know, like a, a butterfly here trying to fly with a noble mission, but I don't like do things that, you know, that require me to do, you know, to have like a very you know, like I fly under the radar, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, however, this does not mean that I'm immune of, of, of things like that, because like Matt says, whatever you do, you know, you are confronted with dilemmas. For example, um, um, no, before I give you the example, I just want to say that um, uh, us as social entrepreneurs have it like a little bit, um, uh, ha are a little luckier, because usually we are driven by a moral compass, and that moral compass in a way helps and sort of like shows you which way. However, there are cases where you could be, you know, facing like a dilemma or, you know, um, you know, you know, things like gray areas, which, you know, the, 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 the way out is not exactly very clear. For example, in my case, uh, I know that uh, many other small businesses in Greece, uh, uh, for example, uh, they try to get things without like proof of purchase or they sell without proof of purchase, which essentially is black money. I do not engage in that. And like sometimes I'm even confronted with that because um, uh, the person that I buy from, they say that they don't, don't want to show the sales, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. To which almost always um, I, I managed to convince them to that this is the way I operate and um, sometimes there are like a people that do not have like a formal entity, a legal entity, but I did find a way to resolve that um, dilemma, because, uh, that situation, because there is like a certain legal window which allows like individuals to basically sell to businesses without with, with some additional paperwork. Um, which I did, however, like I did all the extra miles to, you know, to get them to be legal and to provide them with this opportunity. Uh, one could argue, though, that I, in this way, by doing things legally, I, first of all, I'm losing money because clearly I'm paying 25% uh, is the, 25% is the taxes, tax sales tax in Greece, so I'm losing money there. And I'm putting myself in a disadvantage, obviously, because uh, my, my competitors sell, sell, sell sem similar or same things without all these procedures. You understand that they have a significant leverage and benefit that I do not share. 
um, and yes, people may say that this is even stupid, but uh, I I think um, that once uh, um, uh, that you know you have to play by the rules of the game once you decide to do something because otherwise you know it wouldn't even make sense you know like uh, who would I be trying to kid you know if I try to you know to cut corners. Uh, this is one like um, one like uh, example, one case. Um, one other, but th there are, however, and uh, this I have no experience, thankfully. But there are some cases which um, I'm sure, like Matt and Kakran, who do the more noble things, uh, I have faced or have heard of, where you know um, you have to cut some corners to get like the greater good, to like to have something, you know, to, to obtain something that you otherwise could not. Um, and these are really like hard dilemmas and how you go about, you know, it really has to be like a case by case and see how you can like offset if you've done something which is not exactly, you know, moral or like correct. Uh, but my general rule is like try to exhaust the possibilities that you have within the law and um, try to be creative. Sometimes, you know, creativity helps like alternative ha alternatives help, uh, I think, or I want to think at least. So try to do that because um, I think this um, is your springboard. If you mess it with yourself, then you cannot really move forward that much. That was an interesting answer. Yeah, I think I'd agree a lot with both of you. Um, I actually, as you were talking, like I had, I had many thoughts, so I may have to give like a three part answer, but I'll do try and do it really briefly. Um, I guess the first part I would just kind of talk about is um, my, my father actually. So he is this kind of, he was an entrepreneur, or he is an entrepreneur, excuse me, as I mentioned. Um, and uh, he uh, has just like, I would meet people who had worked for him and they'd talk about him in this certain way that like he was like, like just like magical, right? Like, like it was like, he was like literally like, like God. It was very mysterious to me, like why people walked away with this impression. Cause he, I felt like he was relatively normal and like was kind of annoying. <laughs> um, and what I realized was, is something my dad does is he, especially in India, which is a very hierarchical society, he would always treat people like as a person, <laughs> which I mean, it doesn't sound that crazy. I mean, maybe it sounds more crazy um, in India than it was here, but he created this sort of like, like moral structure within the company that he founded that even as it grew to be almost like, you know, 1500 people, people, they never had tight controls in the company, but, but he, um, he put trust in people and somehow he kind of created that environment. And I would say that that's kind of the thing that I also learned when I was running a company that, that um, people are always watching you. <laughs> you know, you may think they're not, but like in some way someone always is. And so as you kind of take actions, they always, you are really setting a tone all the time. Um, like, you know, when you, I mean, I hate to like to, to overuse a motif, but like, you know, it is kind of like a slippery slope in some ways, right? Because when you make a, a judgment, um, that can lead to other people making other judgments, right? I would say the way that I handle what Matt was saying, which is like, you do have limited time at the end of the day, um, is like, you know, I always push like, like we, we tried to hurt the most, the least, the most vulnerable people least, right? So the people who are being paid the least, which are our tutors, which are um, our students, or of course the most vulnerable, um, our salespeople were, were, you know, often they were being paid very small compared to the rest of us, right? So you're trying to like, to just cascade your, your harm um, when, you, when you have to. Um, and that might mean like, to give you an example, uh, uh, Oh, here, here's a real, real goddamn annoying example. So <laughs> we happen to have our office on the same street as like this local organizer for the nationalist uh, Karnataka like movement. So like there's a Karnataka party that is really pro-nationalist, like pro Canada, like really just that state and they're really pro. And so he and like a bunch of nationalist leaders had called for a bund, which is like they called for a strike uh, for like, a, it was for like a Thursday and it was supposed to continue to a Friday. Uh, and he came uh, and sent some people to our office, which was like four doors down and was like, you can pay me, or if I see people come to your office, we will come and break your windows in and we will like slash everyone's tires and like, you know, we'll, we'll fuck with you for the rest of the time. 
And you're like, okay, <laughs> what do we do in this situation? Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, so what we ended up doing is we just closed for two days. Um, <laughs> uh, and we decided, like, we're just not going to fuck with this. Like, so we closed on Wednesday, we opened on Monday, and we, like, like gave people, like, the ability to work from home, which we hadn't, like, done for, I mean, we couldn't do for everyone, right, because we just didn't have enough laptops, but there are some amounts of, like, you can, anyway, I don't want to get into, like, the full, like, extent of, we had a bunch of restrictions on what we trusted people to do, and we, we had to unpack some of those and say, why were they really there? Um, anyway, long story short, yeah, harm people as little as possible, and, like, try and be as morally upright as you can, and do your best. <laughs> so, <laughs> here, yeah. here, here, here. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for spending the last hour with us and really uh, kind of unpacking this. And uh, this will be available for students to watch too that couldn't make it to the time. So, um, so thank you again for sharing your experiences. And um, oh, I wanted to ask if any of you have sample business plans, would you be willing to share them or let us share them? You know, if you have a sample or anything like that, you know, I think for students thinking about it, that might be helpful. Yeah. But you have to. So. Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, and and Sam, I, I'm happy to talk to people one-on-one -on -one if, if they think I could be useful. And I trust law is the name of the pro bono outfit that I was thinking about earlier. Great. I just sent it in the comments. <laughs> awesome. Okay, <I> promise. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thanks. Good luck. It was Thank great you. to see you guys. Bye-bye.